Next up, uh, we have Dr. Katherine Comer from, from Portland State University. And you're doing a research project on building a blackfish effect. So um, this sort of fits in with the conversation we were just having. Her research is really how can uh, you take what we, you know, what, what's happened, analyze it, and she's going to tell us how to build it for. You're going to tell me. <laughs> for, uh, hopefully, her and her team of researchers will give us an answer down the road of how we can do this again. Good morning. Um, I'm pretty loud. Uh, no, you want a mic. What? <laughs> All right, I'm going to be right here where this mic goes. Good morning, my name is Katie Comer. Um, thank you so much for having me. I cannot see you at all, so this is actually kind of ideal. Um, I'm a teacher, and so there's nothing, uh, nothing too wrong about not being able to see my students when they're disengaged, but you guys are the most engaged crowd around. I'd love to be able to see your faces, but we'll turn the lights on later. Um, so this is my first super pod, and uh, Kim's introduction was both very kind, very generous, and, and a little intimidating because I am presenting research on the people I am researching. And this is very much a work in progress, and so I'm really here to learn from you. And so I'm gonna walk you through my story a little bit, because that's part of what we're sharing here, um, and the research agenda that I'm pursuing, and then I'm going to really um, open up the, the, the conversation, probably not here, because we'll, we'll be short on time, um, but for you to tell me what I need to know in order to do this work and then hopefully we can move it forward together. So, I'm an English professor. Uh, I teach writing, <laughs> writing and rhetoric. And so when I tell people that I'm researching orcas and orca advocates, they get a little confused. Um, but what I do is I study how people compose and circulate text in order to influence, influence audiences' beliefs and behaviors. So the presentation we just, just saw really proves that you all are rhetoricians. Um, you are all thinking in very sophisticated ways about how to leverage your knowledge, these texts, in order to make substantive change. And so my job as a rhetorician is to study you, um, to take this case study and use it to help academics better understand how social change really happens, but also to hopefully help other activists capture some of your magic, use some of your strategies, and move a lot of different causes forward. That's the goal. So, <laughs> this is my moment of embarrassment, you're welcome. Uh, so this is my high school yearbook. Uh, and you'll notice the very important, when I was in high school, what I wanted most of all was to be a marine biologist and to save the whales. <laughs> and this came out of, we're just going to move past this picture now. <laughs> in my defense, I had a fever the day that picture was taken. Um, this, so I was very fortunate when I was a child. My mother was a real animal lover, and still is. And she had, she, did, she gave money to PETA and the Humane Society of the United States. And so I had a lot of this literature coming into my life when I was a precocious nine-year-old, reading PETA magazine, really deciding that this was something that mattered to me. And so over the years, this, is, this continued to be a passion. And as I uh, started to head off to college, I was ready to do marine biology. And I went to Eckerd College, which probably some of you know because it's a marine biology school. Um, Eckerd has what they call an autumn term. So you get there for a month and you're the only, it's just freshmen on campus. And you take one class, it's an intensive course, you kind of settle into college. And I thought to myself, I'm going to take a humanities course before I really dive into these sciences. And I took a course called Story and Its Incarnations. And uh, it was about how stories are told and retold in order to influence different people at different times. And at the end of that course, we had to register for our fall semester, and there were choices between, let's say, molecular cell biology and literature by women. <laughs> so I went over here, and uh, I, but with the reason I became an English professor, or so an English major and eventually a professor, was because what I was really interested in is how we use stories to make change. And so Blackfish obviously becomes a really powerful uh, story for me and uh, obviously for a lot of us. So um, that's a sort of a little bit of background about how I came to be here. And one of the greatest joys in my life is to have come back to that 17 year old uh, to return. I'm not going to be a marine biologist. It's too late for me. But to come back to this question of how do we use stories to help 
the environment and specifically to help marine mammals, which was always a passion of mine. So I feel like I'm among friends here, uh, even though I'm coming from a very different perspective. Not really, you're all pretty rhetoricians, as I said. So this is the first piece I wrote on Blackfish back in 2014. And uh, I had, like many of you, I have very emotional response to animal <coughs> rights issues, and I was afraid to watch it. And my very kind husband watched it for me, and he said, it's okay, you can handle this. <laughs> so of course I cried at the points you cry at, but what I wrote about as I first analyzed it was the power of the strategy that the documentarian used to have the trainers really be the storytellers. Um, there's no talking head, it's just the voices of the people who care most. And that was a really important thing for me to be paying attention to, but what I was concerned about, you guys will see the irony of this, is, oh, is this really gonna do anything? Or is anyone going to watch this if we don't already believe it, right? And uh, you may have heard that a few things happened after Blackfish came out, and there was actually a great deal of effect. And for a rhetorician, and for someone who studies social change, the opportunity to look at something successful um, at effective persuasion is incredibly valuable. We don't get a lot of that. Um, specifically, I study digital activism. And what we get a lot of are stories like Occupy Wall Street and the Arab Spring, these big, what people consider to hashtag revolutions, um, that didn't, according to sort of standard narratives, work, solve the problem, change the world. But they did a lot of other things, obviously. They did, in fact, empower many people. And for a lot of us, they proved what social media could do for communities. And so as I came to uh, begin studying Blackfish, and I've been looking at the phenomenon for some years, I actually really came to it from a digital activist standpoint. I was really curious about Twitter and hashtags. And this is because I didn't necessarily know the backstory. <coughs> and so the first research I did back in 2015 uh, really focused on CNN's launch strategies, the sort of hashtag-driven uh, premiere, celebrities' influences, Ariana Grande suddenly became someone I, was very, I thought was very cool. <laughs> I didn't even know how to pronounce her name before that. Uh, NGO support, the way that organizations got behind this. But then what I really started to see was most interesting were these sort of individual grassroots activists who were working in, um, on their own, right? As you do, <coughs> collectively. So as I began theorizing this, I began trying to understand what really happened. A year later, I presented on uh, the Blackfish Effect, looking at the concept of momentum, which was basically, how did y'all keep this going? Um, and so then I was looking at the way that public outrage and political engagement and policy changes resulted from the conversation that was coming. What really interested me here was the practical strategies. What are people doing to make this work? As we've seen, y'all have a lot of strategies. So at that time, uh, I started to, I partnered with a, a colleague called, named Daniel Carter, who is a Twitter expert. He's a digital media scholar. Um, he understands tech better than I do, certainly. And what we noticed, this is a, a, an analytic of um, the summer of 2016 when tear down those dams became a hashtag. And you'll notice, so this is a basically, this is frequency of mentions, and then down at the bottom is frequency of tweets. You'll notice this little interesting outlier over here. <laughs> <laughs> and that was Hayes. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. And so Dana and I reached out to Hayes, and those of you who know her know that she is very generous with, with her ideas and her humor and her charm. And so we started to just talk to Hayes about what she was doing, what were her strategies, what was working. And the next presentation I gave, you can begin to see a shift from technology to people. And so what I was looking at here is what is Hayes doing for her community? And what I found was she was curating a lot of information. She spent a lot of time putting things together on a website so that people could find it. She was circulating that information, obviously on Twitter, with tweet sheets and really innovative moves. There was a lot of collaboration going on in terms of strategy talks about where, where the team was going to go. And then this interesting move of mediation, um, where Hayes was really, and I know many of you do this now, uh, talking to me about the crossover from orcas in captivity to orcas in the wild, and the way that, you can, that she was trying to, to connect those causes. So if you care about orcas, you should care about these other guys. And so at that point, um, what I was starting to really focus on was how this conversation was expanding. It was several years into the Blackfish effect, and we had moved beyond the movie. 
So finally, and this was this uh, past summer, this summer actually right now, I presented on the free the snake phenomenon. And so I was looking at the way that there are these logical links, right? So if you care about this, you must care about this, taking it all the way from SeaWorld down to Salmon. The way that those logical links helped build community, the way that the hashtags actually became a calling card and a, and a connection, and also these really interesting challenging tensions, right? How do you get people to see these log this logic and to feel that emotional connection? And what are the future directions of the effect? Before this process, uh, before the, this presentation, Hayes introduced me to Jeffrey. And uh, those of you who have talked to him, and you all have, know that this man has an encyclopedic memory of everything that's ever happened related to this cause. He is a researcher's dream. Uh, he archives everything, he remembers everything. It's, ama it's amazing. And so as Jeffrey and I talked over the past year, I started to see that this was so much bigger than hashtags. This was so much more interesting than technology. And so this is the research project that I'm going to talk a little bit about today. This is what I'm working on right now. I am in the middle of this. This is my data collection, you all. And so I can't tell you yet what I've learned, because I need you to teach me first. But what we're doing here is we're really trying to capture the magic. You guys have done ma magic. You've, done, you've made social change happen. Um, and you continue to do that work in a way that is incredibly powerful to observe and to finally get to participate in. Um, so when I started to pitch this project, I said, you know, a lot of people think, myself included, that this was a technology thing. This was about a movie and a hashtag phenomenon. But really, it's about you all. It's about this local, locally grounded, international um, community of people who are doing this work and building on generations, decades of work by people like Naomi Rose and people who have been doing this work for decades but there was a catalyst in this movie where everything came to, or from this movie, where it came together and this community really took shape. And so what I'm trying to do is to capture that. Uh, what were the, this is a community that's used research, that's used networking, and that's used digital media in very innovative ways. And so it's a valuable model for contemporary activism. So as a, as a scholar, I want to understand how you made this happen. And as an activist, I want to understand how we can use that to help other people in their causes. So, what I'm aiming for is a uh, online, open access, peer-reviewed publication. So I'm trying to bridge a gap between academic and public discourse. What I want is something that will sort of have the cred of scholarship for those of us who that, that matters to, and also that will be accessible to non-academics. It's not going to be behind a paywall. It's going to be something that people can use. And uh, we want to highlight those transferable strategies. So there will be tutorials and resources based on what we've learned from you that other people can begin to use. And so I saw Orcas this week. Just <laughs> try not to cry. Uh, they were babies, they were frolicking. <laughs> Everything I ever dreamed of as a child and uh, thank you all for being here and doing this so that I got to do that. Um, so what I'm here really to do is to gather your stories and your wisdom, not to share any of mine because you all understand this way better than I do, as Colleen's presentation just showed, right? Um, so but what I'm looking to do is to understand a couple of things. I have three leading questions here. Uh, what inspired you to become a part of SuperPod? I've been hearing these stories all week. You all have been telling each other these stories all week. They are powerful. They are passionate. And I want to capture some of that. How do you persuade others to get involved? What are the strategies you found effective? What works? And what works for different audiences? Because you can begin to see all these talks are really touching on how do we get those people? How do we get those people? How do we get that link to work? And then finally, what advice would you offer other advocates? You all have more experience doing sustained social work than many people, and they would love to know what you know. And this advice could be anything from avoid that hashtag to avoid that person to uh, <laughs> connect with these particular strategies. So these are the questions that I really have for you, and what I'm hoping to do is um, a couple of things. One, I'm here with audio recorders and assistants. And so a lot of you have already started to find me, and that's amazing, and I'm gonna to try to capture as much as I can, but there are a lot of you, and there is one of me, and I don't wanna miss anything. And so what I wanna do is invite you um, to brainstorm, to talk to each other, to think it over, and then to get in touch. If this is something you're interested in, if you want to share your wisdom, share your strategies, 
and have that be something that teaches scholars how to better understand and advance this work, but also teaches people how to capture your uh, wisdom and use it for related causes, from, sea, uh, from straws to sea turtles. This is something that I, this is my invitation. Come and talk to me, uh, let me record you. I have consent forms, I promise not to, you can excise anything you don't like. You can talk a lot of smack and then tell me to leave it out. I'm okay with that. In fact, I encourage that. Uh, I love to be entertained by smack talk. I can confirm that. Yep. <laughs> Hayes and I get along just fine, I think you can understand. I'm from New Jersey, so that's my snark side. Uh, so this is my contact info. You can reach me, I have business cards around. That's not important. Um, and so I'm happy to take questions, but I would love to learn from you, and that's the most important thing for me here. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's something that personally has always been really important to me. Um, and then when I went to get my PhD, I focused particularly on pedagogy. I'm a teacher and I really care about teaching. And what I started teaching was narrative rhetoric, how do stories change the world? And really, how can I get my students to think in ways about storytelling and influence? And when you, and you guys will know this, when you share stories, when you use narrative, there's a particularly ethical engagement that happens. Um, people listen to stories much more than they listen to arguments. We, we tend to be more generous when people are telling us stories. When we look at the world that way, we tend to think about how we can help, how we can influence, how we can advocate. And so it's always been a subtext of my work. Um, and as I moved uh, into my first position after graduate school, uh, I had been doing this pedagogy work, but I started to feel like that wasn't enough. That was keeping things <laughs> contained within school. And uh, there's so much happening that needs more work. And I'm not the kind of academic who thinks it's valuable just to publish to other academics. We talk to each other plenty. Um, I really think that academics have a responsibility to take what we know and what we understand and to bring it back out, to learn from you and to translate that into something useful. Um, so I really see that as my obligation, uh, as, as an overeducated person, uh, as, a, <laughs> as a teacher. Um, and so it's, it's been actually a real relief for me to bridge that, that professional and personal passion. Does that answer? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Me? Yeah. Okay, um, I'm sorry, this, this isn't really a question. Great, academics never you ask questions in their comments. You mentioned the straws and sea turtles, and I remembered that I wanted to ask the last presenter, but I forgot. Is she around? Call me, are you still here? It's, it's, it's okay, it's just kind of a general okay. thing. But um, my sister is physically disabled, and she, she kind of hangs, you know, she reads other disabled people's stuff mm -hmm. online, and all of them are pretty mad about, like, a possible ban on right. plastic straws, yep. because that makes their lives a lot easier, yep. and, you know, yeah. the mm -hmm. alternate straws. It's actually a real health hazard for Yeah, them. like the mm -hmm. metal or the, the paper straws don't, might not work as well. Yep. And so I guess I'm just saying that, you know, please consider, you know, that other people yeah, and I think this is. Oh, I yes. I have right, uh, and that's something that I think uh, actually, interestingly, social media is really useful for because those stories do get out. Right? There's there's not a critical mass just saying this is the only way we need to move forward. There are those stories that come out and say, actually, hold up. Let's talk about this a little more. Um, and I think that's a really important consideration because if we're dogmatic, if we're, if we're single focused, and if we won't listen, we lose people. And that's dangerous. Yeah. Uh, I assume that you've taught Blackfish to your students before. I have. to know if what, what your students see about it, particularly anything that surprised you in the patterns, mm -hmm. if I'm seeing correctly, you've been presenting for like a year and a half, two couple of years. So yeah. Multiple classes of patterns from the students' response. Yeah. Uh, so I taught Blackfish this spring, and I was teaching it in a writing in English course, which is so I can just slip things in there. This is the beauty of being an English professor. We can make them study anything. Um, and so what I found was most interesting, actually, is that students, my students are ranging in 18 to 28, some of them are older, 
they were like, oh, everyone knows SeaWorld is bad. <laughs> right? Like, oh, we all know this. It's done deal. <laughs> and I was like, well, up until 10 years ago, nobody was really talking about that except a very small circle. So I think that's actually, for me, that was really powerful because that's already a sea change. Right? 10 years ago, you wouldn't have had a bunch of teenagers being like, SeaWorld, the devil. But now my students come in with that expectation. <laughs> Um, and what a lot of students focused on this time, and I think it was really interesting, we live in a time of inflated rhetoric. Emotions and pathos and yelling and anger um, and outrage. And what they, and this is really alienating to students, um, they find it very uncomfortable. So when you teach rhetoric, you really have to work around the idea that it's just yelling. And uh, they were super psyched about the science. They loved the logic. They loved the fact that this wasn't just emotion but it was putting the evidence behind the emotion. And this is something that Hayes, Hayes told me early on and I was so excited to see my students get it. People believe in this, but they need to be able to back it up and they need to be able to use that to persuade thing, people. And so my students, as young people who are really looking to understand and to be involved, um, what they found was the power of this was in the research. It was in the, the um, documentation and it was in the extension beyond the film into uh, how research really matters in the world. So that was actually really big for me. It was really validating for the work that you all are doing here, so that they saw that power. Yeah? Why not a blackfish too? Yeah. <laughs> if this was so powerful, do a GoFundMe mm -hmm. and finance a blackfish too. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, there are other efforts underway. Right. Yeah, I don't know that it was called that too, but other efforts, uh, efforts around finding uh, malaria and smoking time, back retirement, the lungs, um, there's documentaries that are being developed. You know, I don't know what the time it is or what it would take to have them complete, but there are efforts underway. A lot of us have been involved in those. There's five documentary film crews here at Superpod at the moment. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, let's just say, we, we hear what you're asking for. Yes. Yeah. But at the same time, I would say you, you can't recreate what happened. Mm -hmm. This was a magical yeah. moment. Yeah. We talk about a term in, in rhetoric called kairos. And kairos is the opportune moment mm -hmm. at which things are possible and there's an ethical imperative to act. And there was a moment five years ago when this came out where there was momentum already built by the work of activists for years upon years that had laid the foundation. And we also had a time, it was younger, Twitter was younger, and it seemed a little more civil. Um, and I think that, I personally think that, that things might be different right now. Um, and that a documentary about anything as powerful as it could be might have a more difficult time getting play in the uh, over-saturated outrage market. And this, I think a lot of us have seen this as activists. Our energies are really dispersed right now. It is really hard to, to focus and to feel like this is my one thing I'm gonna focus on when every day there's a new calamity um, and there's a new thing that makes us feel passionate so i don't know that what i don't want to do and i i admire the movie i love the movie the movie was a catalyst but i would, what i don't want to do is to reduce this phenomenon to the dawn because how do you take uh talking around the campfire with one of uh, jeffrey's friends mark i don't know if he's here today and he said you can't capture this you can't make this happen again it was a magical moment and so i don't want to put too much weight on the film because you can't tell activists, you know what you need is an awesome documentary. Get someone in and make them record you. Um, and so what I think that's, I think uh, you know, Ingrid really spoke to that as a move, but I also think I don't want to limit it just to the film. I want to talk more about you all and how you move that forward. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what Katie just said, you know, because it's not just a documentary that caused this. And so making another great documentary may have no effect at all, they just fall flat, and then you'd all get depressed. <laughs> so, remember what I said yesterday, you know, you really have to be self-motivated to do this. You have to not burn out and figure out your own strategies not to do that, because um, it was a perfect storm, and to this day, I mean, despite Katie's great work, and I look forward to your paper tremendously, because maybe you'll finally answer the question of why this one? <laughs> Because I don't get it. <laughs> but I'm grateful for it. But don't put your hopes on another great moment. Just keep slogging away. Because mm -hmm. that's the only way 
you're really going to make progress. We were really, really lucky to get this catalytic moment. Don't rely on it. Just keep going. Yeah. Yeah. So let's hope that there isn't. So just one really point to make, and that is that Bill Neal's here. He's actually got a movie almost ready. He's in, it's in production right now. He will be showing a trailer for it later today, and I, I noticed that Naomi's in the film, and Rick O'Berry and others, and some of the people in Blackfish. So there is already like, the next chapter, and you're going to see it today, like at three o'clock. When Bill, who just got back from China and got, gathered some good intel from from there, he's going to have a PowerPoint presentation and a, like a three-minute trailer that, or a couple-minute trailer that's pretty moving. So, you know, it's already here. And I think one of the one of the things that's been most inspiring about this this whole phenomenon to me is that people love to think social change is one big effort, right? We're gonna we're gonna fight the one big fight. We're gonna have the one big victory, and that's going to be it. When what you all know and what you've shown is that it's, that's not it. And you get up the next day and you move on. You keep going and you keep going. And you're going to have setbacks. And so that long-term commitment, that sustained effort, is as important as those flash moments of, of success. In fact, more important is to know that that success is possible and that failure is just a way forward. And Dr. Katie, if I may, Please. I'd like to just mention that I believe personally that the Blackfish effect has been so effective because of all of our abilities to adapt with each new thing and respond to each new thing. So we have to keep adapting because what worked in 2013 may not work in 2018. So we have to just, you know, as Dr. Naomi said, keep it moving. You know, we have that momentum. Don't we have that back. momentum and we've all done magical work in that area. And I am, uh, Kim's gonna stop me. And then, um, please find me afterwards, find me today. I'm around till Sunday because I'm looking to see some more orcas. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna be at Mind Kiln tonight. Um, and we're everywhere, find me. Thank you so much.